Have you ever visited Medieval Times, the restaurant? Now, I love that place. It has everything I want. It has jousting, hawking, little paper crowns, everything. But then my dinner comes. I see there's tomato soup and corn. Both New World ingredients that just would not have been period. But you know what? I'm like, okay, no one else is saying anything, so I'm not gonna be that guy. But then I get my plate, and it's made of pewter. It's not a period trencher, a piece of bread. All the food goes on to soak up the juices. It's a pewter plate, and I just lose it. I stand up, I flip the table, virgin pina coladas and Diet Coke everywhere, and I'm asked to never return to the castle in Buena Park, California. But I calm down, I come home, pour myself a glass of wine, and make my own medieval trencher bread. This time, on Tasting History. Now there were all sorts of bread made during the Middle Ages. You had your pain de main, which was your fine white bread, the most expensive, and then you had your horse bread, which was essentially made for horses. It was made of ground up peas and old beans and whatever you could sweep up off the floor. Then there was a bread called torte, and it was just above the horse bread. It was made of unbolted flour, basically the whole grain of barley or oat or spelt or any of those really expensive flours that you'd get at Whole Foods today. It was the junk back then. And that was the bread that was usually used to make trenchers. Now unfortunately, because baking bread was just so ubiquitous back in the day, they didn't bother to write down any recipes. So we have to rely on later recipes from the Renaissance and the work of excellent culinary historians to have a guess at what medieval bread was like. So with that caveat out there, let's go ahead and make a loaf of torte. For this recipe, you'll need 250 grams of whole wheat flour, preferably stone ground, and 250 grams of any other flour. I'm using 125 grams of dark rye and 125 of oat flour. Then add two and a half teaspoons or one packet of dry yeast. Now, I know what you're going to say. Max, dry yeast was not available in the Middle Ages, and I know. But what they would have used as leaveners were either old dough, which is sourdough, which takes a long time to make, and I have some, but I don't want to waste it on bread that you're actually not going to eat, or ale barm, which is very hard to find and very expensive. So I'm using active dry yeast. But I promise, scout's honor, I think this is how we used to do it, I will make loaves with both ale barm and old dough, or sourdough, in the future, and they will be delicious. So be on the lookout for that. Now the only other ingredient that you'll need is two cups of warm water. What you won't need is salt. Salt was very expensive in the Middle Ages, and they weren't going to waste it on bread that you weren't going to eat. So go ahead and add your water into the flour and begin to knead. Now because of the types of flour that we're using, the kneading process takes forever. I mean, it always takes a long time, but this is really tough. So go ahead and use a stand mixer. I'm not gonna judge you, just like you didn't judge me for using the dry yeast, right? Now usually you knead the bread until you get the window pane. You know, you take up the little piece of dough until you can kind of see the light through it. This is probably never going to get there, and that's okay because we actually want it to stay dense. We don't want a huge rise from this bread. So once the dough is worked enough that it's not completely falling apart, put it into a lightly oiled bowl and let it sit for about an hour. During that time, it will rise, but it's not going to double in size. It'll just get puffy on top, and that's good enough. Now while you wait for the dough to rise, it's the perfect time to smash that like button, and I will teach you a little bit about the history of medieval trenches. Trencher comes from the old French word tranchier, meaning to slice, because that's essentially what it is. It's just a slice of bread that you're gonna put food onto to let it soak up the juices. Then, once you're done, you can feed it to the dogs or to the peasants. How'd you do? Whichever's faster. But the history of trenchers goes back way before the Middle Ages. Even in Virgil's Aeneid, Aeneas is told a prophecy. Never shall you build your promised city until the injury you did us by this slaughter has brought you to a hunger so cruel that you gnaw your very tables. Later, after a rather meager feast, he realized the prophecy had come true when he saw his men eating their own trenchers. You don't eat trenchers, unless you're a dog or a peasant. Oh, there you go, bringing class into it again. 
Now, unless you were a king or an earl or something like that, you didn't have an oven at your house. So how did you make the bread for your trenchers or the bread that you're going to eat? Sometimes people went to communal ovens, often called the king's oven. But more often than not, like today, you'd get your bread from a baker. And there were a lot of bakers. And that created competition. And they didn't like competition. So in 1266, the bakers of Coventry got together and petitioned King Henry III to create what was essentially the OPEC of bread. It was called the Assize of Bread and Ale. It was a set of laws that remained virtually unchanged for 600 years until the Bread Acts of 1822 and 1836. Now the Assize set the price of a loaf of wastel. Essentially, the price of bread stayed the same no matter what the price of wheat was. What changed was the size of the loaf. For example, when a quarter of wheat is sold at 12 pence, then wastel bread of a farthing, white and well-baked, shall weigh 6 pounds and 16 shillings. But when the same quarter of wheat is sold at 18 pence, then a loaf should weigh 3 pounds, 8 shillings. Now you'll notice that because people didn't usually carry around a standard set of weights, they used coins as both the unit of worth and the unit of weight. It's really confusing. It'd be like saying that this bottle of wine costs $22, six nickels, and a penny, but it needs to weigh 14 quarters, three dimes, and seven nickels. Really makes you appreciate standard weights and measurements, doesn't it? Now, like I said, the bread is not going to double in size, but after about an hour, maybe an hour and a half, depending on how warm it is where you are, go ahead and dump the dough out onto your work surface and knock out the air, then shape it into a round loaf. Now again, the dough is not going to stretch like a normal dough, so make sure you don't tear it as you form your loaf. Then cover the loaf and let it rise for another 20 minutes while you preheat the oven to 450 degrees Fahrenheit with a baking sheet already inside. Once the loaf is puffed up a bit, score the top with either a cross or a star and pop it into the oven for about 10 minutes at 450. Then drop the temperature to 375 for another 20 minutes until the loaf is baked through. And there we have it. A loaf of bread ready to make into trenchers. Not so fast. You actually have to wait three days or so because the loaf has to get stale. Then you'll slice it, and that is your trencher bread. Now all of the ingredients and the recipe are listed in the description down below, as well as links to some of the flours I used. If you end up making your own loaf, leave me a comment down below and let me know how it goes. Also, if you have any recipes in mind that you want me to try out, I'm always looking for suggestions. So make sure to like, subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you next time on Tasting History.